From the mountains to the floodplains, the women in the Himalaya are battling against climate change and water insecurity. We're fighting a water war. These amazing women, they're not only primarily responsible for collecting that resource, but now they have to conserve it. If I have 20 liters of water today, how do I allocate that? I have animals to feed, I have children to feed, I have food to cook. It's crazy the amount of decisions and battles that they have to fight every day and, we, and they're still not a part of the decision-making process at the macro level. I mean, they are the WWW for me, they're women water warriors. So who are these women? And how are they adapting and battling climate change in the Himalaya? We often hear that women are on the front lines of climate change, that they're more vulnerable and more severely impacted. That's also the case in the Himalayan region. Where we were looking at the gender vulnerabilities, India, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And in all across all these countries, what we see is insecurity of women. It's a widespread issue that crosses national borders, but it's complicated. They are definitely disproportionately impacted but there are different intersections. There is an intersection of caste, class, um, sex, geographies, uh, marital status, age. And how climate change differently impacts these groups is still not understood well. But one thing's for sure, women living in remote, high elevation areas are among the most vulnerable, especially when it comes to water. Because of the climate change, water resources are high. You know, more than about 90% of the population uh, depends on springs springs in the Indian Himalayan region are drying um, and at an alarming rate. In Nepal, each year you have to dig a deeper well to get water. And the consequences are drastic. Climate change has led to higher risks and greater burdens for women. With diminishing prospects in rural areas, more and more men are migrating, leaving women with more responsibilities at home. The women are left to take care of their children at the same time um, to uh, perform all their domestic duties such as farming, or fetching water from the sources. And as springs and rivers dry, they have to search further afield. On an average, a local woman would spend up to five hours collecting drinking water. That distance is very uh, significant considering, you know, the uh, steep slopes that they have to walk carrying around 20 to 40 liters of water. Which has led to all sorts of trickle-down effects. This whole business of women's reproductive health. Uh, besides miscarriages also, they undergo a lot of uh, medical complications because of which they are even forced to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, get uh, abortion done just to save the life of the mother. So that is mainly because they have to undergo so much physical stress in fetching water. Malnutrition or undernourishment because food security is becoming an issue. Women and girls take a back seat when it comes to food. You know, they are the last ones to eat, often the least to get. And school has become a luxury. Girls have to drop out of schools, especially in the lean season. Daughters leaving school to take over child care duties or water collection. Water insecurity has also posed a problem of safety. You know, with men out migrating in large scale, women are left behind alone to fend for themselves security-wise. Because of this, women are entering spaces, public spaces, which, were, which they did not enter earlier because those were men's domains. This has led to an increase in sexual harassment and violence. But perhaps the biggest impact is the long-term ripple effects it will have on the generations to come. Women in the mountains that I worked with spend on an average less than an hour with their children because they have no time. They are not able to focus uh, on uh, the children's development, uh, as in educating them. All this empowerment can continue intergeneration-wise for women and girls. But as she also points out, it's not all about disempowerment. There's so much more to the story. Because they're vulnerable doesn't mean they are passive. What gives me hope is to look at the kind of solutions and the kind of movements that uh, rural local communities have, uh, you know, sort of undertaken on their own. Some are experimenting with adapting water practices. Women are taking on rules of how do we use less water in, in, in our homesteads, not only the family house, but also in the agriculture. Practices of uh, altering these cropping patterns or getting new crops which are not so water intensive. 
others are working to protect and restore their water sources, like they're planting trees which helps reduce soil erosion and promote spring recharge. They will uh, plant trees around their springs. They will guard those trees. They will uh, you know, make sure that if uh, uh, the water is uh, distributed equitably in a village. Women are also breaking social norms and taking leadership roles in their villages to manage water. So we form a village level institution and this village level institution is comprised of women. This water user committee uh, uh, becomes the whole uh, governing body for implementation of any treatment plan. From being shy even to take the names of their husband or something, now they are in a position of uh, even going and giving lectures to the government officials. And I think that is a very tremendous change and it has not happened overnight. Rural women are playing a huge role in climate adaptation on the ground. But despite having to shoulder so many responsibilities, women in the region still don't hold the corresponding decision-making rights. The power structure need to facilitate that um, it's not just men that get into decision-making positions. If the structural inequalities are not addressed or not taken into consideration, things are never going to change. And policies need to expand to be more gender inclusive and account for the diverse lived experiences of people in the region. I think you do need uh, some kind of policy recognition on women's role, managers as leaders or whatever you want to term it. You know, we keep saying, let's empower women. Women are empowered, they know. Let's empower the other people who still think women are disempowered, they don't know. Just that recognize their knowledge and the value. I think that's the message we need to give more.